SIGT Report is proudly brought to you by Tower, Rural Insurance Specialists. Welcome to Tower Sector Report. I'm David Beetson, and in this edition, it's a spray time, spring time, snow time special. Will our kiwi fruit be protected from another outbreak of PSA? What's worrying the world of agricultural aviation? And how the record snowfall could affect the lambing season. It's now spray time in kiwi fruit country. Growers are asking if newly developed sprayers will be enough to protect the crop from the rapidly spreading blight of PSA. In a race against time, field trials are still underway to test new chemical solutions. And in the Bay of Plenty, the Regional Council is warning that it'll take a hard line on any sprayers who breach environmental safety rules. Here's a stock take from our Rural Affairs correspondent, Drew Chappell. On the surface, as the sun shines brightly on Tapuki, the self-professed kiwi fruit capital of the world, everything seems full of hope and promise. Indeed, this time last year, orchardists were receiving a well-earned pat on the back as industry marketer Zespri held their annual conference, aiming for a $3 billion sector within the decade. But just 12 months on, and all is not well. Signs of a bacterial infection were spotted on several vines in November last year, confirming the worst fears of our orchardists. We had the dreaded vine disease, PSA. Subsequent tests revealed it had been here since at least 2007, though it is still not known how it entered the country. New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Growers Chairman Peter Ombler, whose fruit is not affected by the disease, says orchardists have had their fingers crossed winter would slow the disease down. But so far, it hasn't. It's obviously, uh, it's got it at some point during the growing season or during autumn uh, at leaf fall, and um, there are some examples where there were a few symptoms actually in, in the growing season, but regrettably we're seeing symptoms of being expressed in vines now. And that's not even the worst of it. The disease infects the vine and halts its growth, eventually killing the whole plant if left untreated. Peter Rombler says until there is a reliable, approved treatment available for infected growers, they simply have to be patient. Currently, if you've got it, it's, it's, uh, we're struggling to find anything at the moment that's what we call curative. Um, but, uh, you know, that is one of the main focus of what is the main focus of research and development is to find uh, ways that we can live with this thing in our environment and actually coexist with it commercially. We're expecting to see a number of symptoms uh, are actually being exhibited as we speak now, and, and particularly in gold vines, uh, the same as the ones behind me. And as the sap rises, if there's any uh, PSA actually in the plant, that tends to be expressed at bud burst or around bud burst, which is about now. So uh, we are seeing in, in some orchards, and uh, especially in the priority zone in Te Puki there, uh, we are seeing those... those um, uh, th that particular type of um, feature being exhibited by the vines. So I suppose it's up to organisations like MAF and Zespri to, uh, to work together on this? Uh, not just Zespri either, it's, um, there's, there's, a, there's a number of industry initiatives. Um, Task Force Green, which is a, uh, an initiative with uh, both Seeker and Eastpac, uh, working hard on this as well. Uh, some of the other post-harvest facilities, the one I pack with, Trevadians, is also uh, working on this matter. Um, and you know there's, there's, there's a heap of innovative growers who are trying different things and New Zealanders are good at this stuff, they're good at um, getting a bit of number eight wire and solving a problem you know so uh, there'll be a whole lot of people working hard on this and the more the better from our point of view. Heading up research into treatment options is the Ministry of Agriculture in association with industry bodies and pharmaceutical companies. Under the advice of Minister Kate Wilkinson, MAF recently greenlit an industry proposal to fast-track the testing of chemical treatments for PSA, giving them priority over other applicants. MAF's ACVM Approvals Director, Debbie Morris, says at the moment growers are trying current spray treatments that aren't specifically designed for PSA. 
It is actually, um, it is okay to use products off-label, but I think with PSA we want to be sure that the products have some degree of efficacy and actually do work to control the PSA disease. So um, it really is important that we get on-label claims and that growers have some comfort and confidence in, in what the products can do. The researchers are looking at what, um, what's been used in other countries for the different strains of PSA and have come up with things that should work in New Zealand and have provided data to support applications from, you know, from use in other countries. Zespri's General Manager of Grower Relations, Simon Limmer, is one of those keeping a close eye on developments in the lab as researchers rush to find a suitable treatment. He says our winter conditions haven't been harsh or cold enough in the Bay of Plenty to slow down the disease. Springtime's always been a critical time for us. We're really um, conscious that as the activity in the vines and the sap flow starts happening, um, that we're going to see a lot more of, of uh, the extent of PSA. Uh, it's probably come a little bit earlier than we expected. We've seen movements throughout the, the winter period. In fact, it's been such an unusual winter. Also, I suppose it's... Um, uh, you know, our expectations have been um, met, um, that spring's come a little bit earlier, we're seeing movement out there now, um, but really over the next couple of months we're going to know a little bit more about what's, um, what is happening, what is the extent of the spread of PSA. Zespri has also kept a close eye on Italy, which suffered a huge loss of profit after PSA swept through vines earlier in the decade. Our experience in Italy um, showed that over summer in particular they had extreme, they have extremely hot summers in Italy, about 35 degrees and, and really PSA um, doesn't, doesn't show itself at all during that time. And similarly in winter, really cold winters up to minus 15 uh, and the, the, the plant activity really just about stops during that time. Um, so the difference we have in New Zealand, we're a much more temperate climate of course and we're, our, our winters and, and summers uh, do tend to run together a little bit more. Um, so we had hoped that we might have seen more of the activity that they've had up in Italy, a little bit of a slowdown in the disease, but it's just sort of continued to creep throughout the winter and now we're seeing um, greater activity. As the vines sit dormant about a month out from bud break, all growers are working hard to ensure their vines are ready for the new season. The conditions right now are perfect for spraying high cane, a chemical which helps promote bud growth but is hazardous to humans if inhaled. Peter Rombler says no matter what health your vines are in, the spraying season is a crucial time of year. You can't forget your normal jobs, you have to do all the normal jobs on your orchard but you have to combine those with um, PSA protection regimes as well. There are uh, PSA protectant sprays being put on uh, as we speak and uh, uh, primarily that's copper protection and the, the whole point of spraying for PSA is to try and protect yourself from getting it. That's the whole point of it. So it's like an umbrella over your orchard if you like. Bruce Gardner from Environment Bay of Plenty says growers must continue to be vigilant around potentially hazardous chemicals like high cane. High cane can be quite dangerous to human health so yeah, they've got to take uh, extra precautions with that um, just to make sure that you know, um, those that are using public land nearby or neighbours are uh, properly protected. Kiwi fruit growers who are spraying are required to provide signs in order to alert the public and their neighbours about the type of spray being used, the date of spray, the date of safe re-entry and a contact phone number. And also to help out the posties, they cover their mailbox with a yellow bag. Bruce Gardner says the vast majority of growers are vigilant around spray time, but this year could be different. There's just one or two that, that um, I guess because of the very compressed nature of the high cane season, end up having to spray when conditions are less than ideal as it comes towards the end of the season, um, who have to you know, forge on and get the work done. Sometimes we can get problems in, but by and large, yeah, the industry has really sat up and taken a lot of notice of the messages that we've been trying to get across. In the meantime, while they wait for a solution from the laboratory in the boardroom, most growers are simply getting on with their work, resigned to the fact there's not much they can do. Growers are fundamentally saying to us, you know, um, we need answers, we need, we need um, some ways that we can deal with our problem. And, and, uh, and that's, that's a range of, 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 of solutions and I, I guess the big solution for the likes of Nelson and Kerry Kerry is, is 
not to move any plant material or manually take the, the disease, if you like, on, on a piece of machinery or a bit of plant material. Um, and I guess the, the big thing we're trying to do in this area is trying to find ways to help to protect your orchard from windblown infection. Zespri says it currently has more than 80 separate project groups researching treatments for PSA, working around the clock. For now though, there's a sense of resignation among those whose livelihoods depend on the lab results. This gets worse before it gets better. There's no, no, no hiding from that. That's, that's the reality. Um, well, but the thing is we have to hang on to the hope that, that it does get better. That it only gets better with, a, with us you know, putting in a big effort as an industry to, to solve the problems we've got. Drew Chappell reporting. Next, why the agricultural aviation sector is on the road to promote a consistent approach to environmental safety. Stay with Tower Sector Report. Representatives of the Agricultural Aviation Association are hitting the road with a call for consistent countrywide approach to regulating the environmental safety in aerial spraying and top dressing operations. The association has spent years in developing an independent quality assurance program and codes of practice, only to find that not a single council in the country has adopted them in their resource management planning. Now it's trying a different approach in a roadshow round all 16 regions of New Zealand to promote partnerships with a set of environmental guidelines that agricultural aviators have developed and know they can observe. John Sinclair from the Agricultural Aviation Association told me why the effort is necessary. Welcome John, yeah, you're out on the road to every region in New Zealand. But what's driving you to get out there and try and get some consistent environmental safety guidelines in place? Pretty much, David, it's, a, it's an outcome of from within the industry where the aviation industry has recognised that it's had some issues. Um, the issues, I guess, loosely in terms of um, how people would see them would be spray drift, um, putting product in the wrong place. Uh, and lately noise is, is a big issue for us. So the driving force for the air care program has come from within the industry. Um, but what we're doing is now... Is that because you've been getting beaten up in the field by people saying, well, what, are you, what are you guys doing? <laughs> there's, a, there's a wee bit of that. Yeah. There's a wee bit of that, but it's, it's, not, it's not too bad at all. I mean, the industry's made huge inroads um, in its um, environmental safety over a number of years now. If you were to measure it in terms of spray drift incidents, 15 years ago I think there were about 23 insurance claims a year in New Zealand for spray drift, aerial spray drift. Mm -hmm. um, and for every one that made it to a claim, there was probably six that didn't make it. Are these big claims? Typically, no, they're not. Well, they haven't, they, they weren't back then. Um, these days, uh, that's improved enormously. We're down to one or two a year, but we're still getting them. And perhaps even the last couple of years, I mean, there's been three this year I can think of, and they're not small claims. So, uh, you know, quite clearly, one of your concerns has to be that if you don't actually self-regulate, you're going to be regulated. That's exactly that is exactly the point. And if, if we regulate ourselves, which is what we're doing, um, we're not going to write regulations that we can't comply with. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if a regulator does it for us, as they have been doing, um, we have situations um, around New Zealand with some of the regional councils, some of the regional regulators that have written rules that. They just don't make a lot of sense. Have they been tested in the court and have been, these problems actually been highlighted? No, they, no, they haven't gone to court, but yeah. we, we're just seeing issues. We see issues with really just two areas with, with the regional rules. There's the complexity of some of the rules. Uh, there's one I can think of that uh, no one, I don't think, can understand what they mean in terms of notification in, in one area for notifying people. You're not people. meant to understand it, you just meant to do it. Yeah, but you yes. can't do it if you can't understand it. <laughs> and and um, the other is the commonality between the, the different rules, um, and, and that creates a lot of problems. I mean, we have we have individual farms that are in two different regions. Two different regions. Oh. So you've got two different sets of rules on the and same I, farm. And, how and they, can they be quite different? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in terms of notification, in terms of of um, some of the buffer zones that councils. Um, say they need, like for example, instead of saying we don't want fertiliser in a waterway, 
they'll say you're not allowed to release fertiliser within 40 metres of a waterway. Well, that's, that means that the, the customer is actually missing out on getting the whole job done. Um, mm. So there's some cost there for, you know, for our farming friends. Just, just give me um, some notion about the financial significance of, the, of the, the contribution that the agricultural aviation sector is actually making to regional yeah. and, and national economies. The whole, the whole of the aviation sector, um, NZ, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise did a um, study last year on that and they discovered that we're worth $10 billion to the New Zealand economy. $10 billion. $10 billion. That's all of aviation. Yeah. Ag aviation, just ag aviation, uh, is $2 billion of that. $2 billion. And that's, that's yeah. in terms of what New Zealand would lose in export income if you weren't up, if we weren't, yeah, if we were closed down. Why is it that uh, the situation has developed where local authorities really aren't, ha haven't been effective, haven't been coordinated in their approach to developing uh, well, an, an appropriate environmental safety good, it, framework for aviation? It's a, that's a really good question. I, I think one of the issues with councils is that. The, the, they want a safety outcome. For example, they don't want fertiliser on waterways, they don't want spray drift going over a boundary. And it's really interesting, and, and they've gone down a regulatory pathway to, mm. to try and achieve that, not understanding, and this is really important, they're not understanding the capability of the industry. And then on the other hand, you've got the industry, um, it doesn't want to put fertiliser in waterways either, and it doesn't want to have spray going over the boundary. So in actual fact, our two... Um, two goals are quite aligned in a lot of ways, but yeah. we've taken two very different pathways to get to get to it. I mean, and you're talking about self-regulation, you're talking about providing guidance to councils. Can you actually get enough discipline among your operators to achieve the kind of environmental safety uh, just on the basis of guidance and, and self-regulation? We believe we can. Um, because Have you got a history of that? What's the history? The, this this program is has morphed from what was the NCAA accreditation program. It's been around 15 odd years. And what our experience with that is that we've had very little in the terms of disciplinary processes to go through. Tell me this, uh, how far advanced is the partnership? Obviously you need a partnership, a broad partnership. You've got DOC to think about, you've got regional authorities to think about, you've yeah. got farmers, customers to think about, you've got your your own industry to think we've, about. We've got a, is, is that working? Yes it is. We've got an excellent partnership with the Department of Conservation um, and that, their concern was noise abatement, or just noise, aircraft mm -hmm. noise, um, and we've been able to address that with Air Care to their satisfaction. And so they're requiring every aerial operator that works in the Docker state to be air care accredited. And that's what, so there's a partnership that's working really well. Um, we've got the Landcorp have said that they will only use air care accredited operators because they've got concerns with a lot of their properties, have got um, waterways and things that, that they, and, and um, refuge areas and that, that they don't want to get fertiliser into, so they want best practice. Uh, Animal Health Board is, is requiring air care because they want best practice in terms of spreading um, poison baits. The, the council one, we haven't got any partnerships with them yet. I mean, this project's only started last month. And it's that's a, your objective, it's get three, all 16 regional authorities yes, it is. into that partnership. Yes, it is. We, we've got, it's a three-year project, and um, what we're doing at the moment is we're having meetings around each council in New Zealand, um, each regional council, 16 meetings, um, just to engage with them. And it's been really interesting because we've got pilots uh, for the first time ever, I think, and regulators, environmental regulators, sitting in the same room. We'll watch what happens with, <laughs> with, with great interest, John. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. John Sinclair from the Agricultural Aviation Association. Well, we've had some pretty extreme weather in the last week, uh, just as the sheep farmers were heading into the vital lambing season. We'll find out what's brewing next on Tower Sector Report. Our next guest is the weather watcher who told us recently that spring had sprung. Well, since then, he's been reporting on one of the most extreme snowstorms in this country's history. And to find out what's driving this freaky weather and why we should expect even more extreme weather in future, here's Country 99 TV's very own weather analyst, Philip Duncan. Philip, welcome. Hi. Well, early this month on this very channel, you said spring was here. What went wrong? <laughs> well, spring is uh, here. I think it has arrived ah. early this year. Uh, where? Where? <laughs> well, spring is made up of 
hot and cold air. I mean, that's what makes spring. It's the mixture of everything. Now, yes, OK, this is certainly extreme. One of the coldest events New Zealand's ever had. But it's short-lived. But what feedback have you been getting on the Weather Watch website? What are, what are, what are the fans been telling you, Philip? Well, they've been um, Get your blown act away. together. They've been blown away. They oh, were really? blown away with the accuracy because no. what happened was we predicted the snowstorms well in advance. We've been saying you're high risk. Now, the reason why we've had this incredible storm is just a simple part of nature. All these people are saying it's climate change. So uh, like, we don't know yet. Just a just one-off storm just is a not a simple part change. of nature. OK, so what's the, what, what's the, the credible scientific explanation? of why we get snow and spring all at the same time. Well, because spring is um, winter departing and summer coming in. And if you think about it, they don't really like each other. Winter and summer, they, they fight. And when they fight, they fight over New Zealand. And it's why we get a lot of violent weather. Our most violent weather is spring. And so because we've got an early start to spring and we've still got the depths of winter with us right now, uh, we were expecting a higher risk of storms. And that's why we've had this one. Yeah, not just the depths of winter. This is probably the, the deepest depth yes. we've, we've yeah come to and I don't know how long. How long? It's been about, well, some, some are saying 50, others are saying 80 years. It's been a long, long time, but not everybody's had it. And, uh, and you know, even the snow around Auckland um, wasn't as heavy as some other snowfalls. So it's, uh, it's, every region was different. Some records were broken, others weren't, and um, some people completely missed out. We've got a high risk till the end of October. Right and through to the end of October. Yeah, and that is because we don't have La Nina and we don't have El Nino, and those two weather patterns drive a certain force. Like, a, like for example, <laughs> yeah, La sure Nina. Do. La I Nina mean, brings in the nor'easters and you get a lot of rain and you get a consistent sort of weather forecast at the moment we don't have either so we're up to just whatever the weather feels like doing we have a big high at the moment 6,000 kilometres long uh, we've got a low that's 4,000 kilometres wide and the two met over New Zealand and, uh, you know <laughs> but, uh, I mean I, I can't get over it you know La Nina and El Nino uh, we used to be complaining about them being a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah now, well, now we're missing them. And you know what? And this is what um, Niwa would tell you and, and other scientists who, who back climate change will be saying to you that this is the problem now with climate change. Here in New Zealand, we're going to be very sheltered from it. We're going to be one yeah. of the best places in the world for global warming. But in saying that, we're going to still be exposed more and more to extreme weather. Now, this, this system yeah. on its own, you can't say is climate change. But if we get another one like this and another one next year and another one in three years' time, well, then we might be looking at something yeah, I, I want to ask you about that. I mean, looking back over the last uh, year, two, three, five, four, four or five, we, we do seem to be getting extreme climate change with increasing intensity. Is that actually the fact and is, it, is that trend evident in your weather record? Well, it's hard to look back because what you need to do for, for climate change, we need to see a big picture. We need to look at 20, 30, 40 years, even longer, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. Um, we've only got records that go back maybe 130 years at most. So we're struggling to sort of get a good picture. But, you know, there is scientific proof that the world is getting warmer. And when you get warmer, you get more snowstorms mm -hmm. because there's more moisture in the air. So you get a shot of cold air out of Antarctica hitting that warmer, slightly warmer air and you get a lot more snow. So that's, that's the concern. But the other side of it is um, it's, hard to, it's hard to gauge exactly if we're getting more uh, storms and more severe weather events because technology is getting better. Um, a friend of mine at the Weather Channel in America yeah. was saying they're detecting hurricanes that were never detected before. Tornadoes are being detected when they've never been detected before. And with social media, Facebook, YouTube, cell phones, we're getting videos of tornadoes, yeah. of snowstorms that are, we wouldn't have got before. Are we keeping pace with that? I mean, are you in a situation where you've got adequate technical cover now to, to give the kind of advance warning that our farmers need to take precautions? Most of the time. Um, there is still a 20% chunk that we don't get right. And, um, you know, I don't work at Met Service or Niwa. I'm not involved with the huge government resources that go into these things. But I've spoken to um, Dr. James Renwick at Niwa. He's a great guy. And he's talking about a supercomputer which costs you know, $13 million. It costs a lot to run it. And they're, they're getting some good success stories out of that. But at the end of the day, um, we won't probably ever get to being 100% good with predicting weather. And, and, and part of me doesn't want to. It's kind of fun to not know everything about life. <laughs> it's, like wanting, it's like knowing when you're going to yeah. Yeah, the expectation, want to know that. And the expectations <laughs> on you get much higher, don't they? Exactly. Uh, okay, I, I yeah. don't have much yeah, of a job yeah, if the computers just, do it all. You want to keep it 20% <laughs> frost. Uh, let, let me just come back on this uh, question uh, of um, climate change because there's an assumption, I think, that, that farmers are climate change deniers. True or false? Oh, I think there's certainly a perception of that. I don't know if it's true or not. I, I honestly don't know. Can you help us test this assumption? 
Yes, we can. I think we should run a poll. OK. I think we should run tell a me, poll. Tell me the about funds. the poll. Well, we're thinking about running a poll um, from weatherwatch.co.nz and through Country 99 TV. And we're, I think we should do a poll where we ask the farmers whether or not you believe climate change is happening um, and, and, and ask for solutions on what you think is, is going to help it. I mean, are you doing things on your farm? Are you actually concerned about climate change? When can we start? Well, look, I can put on as uh, I'll, I'll get something up on the site now, and we'll um, we'll ask people for their feedback. Okay, and and my commitment to you is we'll keep track. Yes, Philip Duncan, thank you very much. Thank you, Philip Duncan, weather analyst here at Country Ninety Nine TV. Well, that's all for now. Remember, you can catch our show again anytime via the internet at www.country99tv.co.nz. So, thanks for joining us on Tower Sector Report. Bye for now. Report was proudly brought to you by Tower, Rural Insurance Specialists.